Hello, everybody. Uh, tonight's uh, segment is going to be a little bit different. Most architects don't really deal with planning, and so we're going to. Hello? And tonight's uh, fourth segment uh, will be Dolores um, Hayden, who is a planner. Uh, most architects really don't deal with planning, and um, it's very important that we. Uh, that this subject is talked about, as well as also interior design, which will be Joe Durso next week. Um, I'm going to introduce Susan Nelson, who's going to speak a little bit about planning, and then uh, Dolores Hayden will, will um, talk about her, uh, her new book, Redesigning the American Dream. One has to be an acrobat. <laughs> In any case, I'm very happy to be here this evening because um, SciArc in general has not been willing uh, to deal with the overall city, with the overall questions of growth, of race and class, which are really um, the central theme of uh, what has happened in post-war America. I am very pleased to introduce Dolores Hayden, who comes from UCLA in planning particularly an institution which on the west side has been a node of growth in its own right and has been fought its expansionism on the edges of its campus by those that live around it and um, has, I don't think, the planning department there has exactly dealt with the question at hand which is the, um, not the theory so much as the practice of planning. And we are beginning to see in, in Los Angeles, particularly with the demise of Calvin Hamilton, this sort of retreat um, from uh, the kind of neoliberalism that he uh, represented in the city that somehow if we identified certain growth centers in the city and then downzoned the rest, we'd have the ideal centered Los Angeles, which would allow infinite expansion into the countryside, and then we would have infinite uh, uh, high, high rise in the centers. Well, uh, we are seeing now uh, about uh, 20 years after Calvin Hamilton was hired by the city of Los Angeles to promote growth in an area that was particularly interested me in the Santa Monica Mountains, that he is no longer uh, acceptable. And I gather the reason for this being that now that it comes to down zoning between the centers, such as Westwood and Santa Monica, um, these people uh, that uh, own the land, the special interests, do not want such down zoning to occur and want uh, high rise to go on indefinitely and growth to go on indefinitely based on expansion of um, real estate property interest and the um, importation of water and the exportation of sewage without any appropriate transportation. I think that Dolores has hit on uh, the central idea that we must uh, begin to uh, deal with human relationships and the workplace and the way people live in the community um, as, a, as a main issue in, in planning. And I would like to introduce her. I know her briefly from a writing class and from her books and reading, and I'm very pleased to present Dolores Hayden. I'm very glad to be here at SciArc tonight. I'd like to begin by taking you back to March 1943. We're in a new town which is under construction. It's mired in spring mud, striped with the treads of bulldozers. There are trucks pouring foundations, giving way to trucks that are hauling in piles of lumber and siding from the northwest. There are carpenters, plumbers, and electricians all trying to stay out of each other's way. They're working evenings, Saturdays, and Sundays. Architects from the firm of Wolf and Phillips are conferring on the site six, ten, a dozen times a day. And the project architect says to a reporter, all my life I've wanted to build a new town, but not this fast. 
We hardly have time to print the working drawings before the buildings are out of the ground. At the same time that the town is going up, there are shipyards where construction is going on 24 hours a day. There are three shifts. Workers are pouring out of the gates at 8 a.m., 4 p.m., and midnight. Each shift, the tired workers leave, and they're replaced by new workers, men and women in coveralls, carrying protective goggles, headgear. The personnel office in the state of Oregon is recruiting as far away as New York and Los Angeles with ads in newspapers. They want welders, riveters, electricians. They offer on-the-job training, housing, child care, all fringe benefits. They advertise also for maintenance workers, nursery school teachers, elementary school teachers, and nurses. In 10 months, this personnel office does enough hiring to populate the entire new town. They hire and bring in the families of the workers for a total of 40,000 people, white, black, Asian, and Hispanic workers and their families. This is the first time that an integrated, publicly subsidized new town of this type has ever been built in the United States. Can I have the first two slides, please? Is it possible to have the lights a little dimmer up here, or do you need them? Thank you, that's, that's much better. The chief engineer from the Federal Public Housing Authority is checking the last of the construction details as the residents, cars and pickup trucks and moving vans start to arrive. Incredible as it may seem, it was only 10 months from schematic designs to occupancy. The project architect said he never had a more demanding design program to meet, never a more impossible timetable. He had to rethink so many basic questions. He had to rethink every idea he ever had about normal family life, about men, women, and children. He had to design affordable housing for all types and sizes of households, including single people, single parent families, and non-family groups. This project had to be designed for low maintenance costs, and for energy efficiency to make the maximum use of extremely scarce natural resources. The designer was told to emphasize public transportation by bus and not to assume that anyone would get anywhere by private car. And most of all, the housing had to be designed with a very specific pathway understood between housing and job sites. The client, in fact, said, quote unquote, on a straight line, unquote, because he didn't want parents to have to make long journeys to drop off or pick up their children before work or after work. Every minute counted. This new town had large child care centers that were open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just like the shipyards. And on the far screen, you can see the plan of one of the child care centers there. A number of pavilions surrounding a central courtyard, and out in the front, a space where parents picking up their children could also pick up hot casseroles to take home and reheat in their private apartments so that no extra time was lost on cooking rather than spending those last precious hours of the day with the children. The child care centers were also oriented so the children could have views of the workplace where their parents were working. It not only worked very well, it cost 75 cents per day per child. You may think that I'm telling you about utopia. <laughs> I heard a yes there. I'm telling you about Vanport City, Oregon and the making of housing and a human settlement for the wartime Rosie the Riveter families. The popular song at the top of the hit parade in the 1940s had this stanza in it. All the day long, whether rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory, Rosie the Riveter. It was built, it was a smashing success, 
It received a tremendous amount of positive publicity. And at the end of World War II, the Rosie the Riveters had their union contracts canceled. Often they were just written for the duration. At the end of World War II, a good deal of the housing in this new town of 40,000 people was dismantled, and some of the rest of it was swept away in a flood. In its place came the American dream we are so familiar with in terms of Levittown, New York, and the single family dream house created for the post-World War II returning veteran and his wife, who is expected to be a non-wage earning housewife, living in that house, maintaining that house, and uh, raising a family of children there. With the end of World War II, American society went through a very cataclysmic process of trying to change from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy. And the housing pattern with which all of us Americans are still trying to cope was set in those post-war years, the late 1940s and early 1950s, a pattern that all of us will still be trying to deal with in the 1980s and the 1990s. As we represent American society, a society where the post-World War II family is no longer the dominant family type. The dominant family type in the United States today is the family with two employed persons. Over half of all women are in the pay labor force. Over half of the mothers of children under six are in the pay labor force. The fastest growing household type is the single parent family, which accounts for about 13 to 14% of American households. And a really astonishing number of Americans live in one person households, live alone. That's uh, in the 1980 census, over 22% of Americans, young or old, are living alone. Nevertheless, we're a nation which has splurged its resources on the housing pattern illustrated here in this little diagram of Levittown. And the issues I'd like to explore with you tonight are how did this come to be and how might designers and planners and citizens come to terms with some of these very large cultural issues about private life and family life that have been tied into our built environment in some very complicated and uh, difficult ways. I don't know that I have a tremendous number of answers to offer you tonight. I'll certainly speculate on what some of the answers would be. But I'd like you to join with me in this question of um, looking again at the American dream of single family home ownership as a statement about good family life, solid neighborhoods, and upward mobility in American society. And I'd like to ask you all to join with me in re-examining this and perhaps in redesigning this American dream. About 10 years ago, I started on a project of looking at Ameri the history of American housing design. I was introduced tonight as a planner, and I am a professor of urban planning at UCLA. but. Um, I actually started my life being trained as an architect, and I was particularly interested in being an architect concerned with low-income housing. I did my graduate work in architecture at Harvard. I studied with a lot of people who had worked with Le Corbusier, and uh, in particular with Shadrach Woods, who is an outstanding housing architect in Europe who'd come to the United States. And I was a very idealistic young architecture student who wanted to figure out how you could possibly make decent housing in America. At that time, I don't think that anybody at Harvard or any of the other major uh, architecture schools in the United States would have really been very interested in talking about Levitt, Levittown, or the, the suburban dream. It was something that people hoped that the United States might get over somehow, uh, rather than something that architects felt that they should be extremely knowledgeable about or concerned with. I was also at that time particularly concerned about the role of women uh, as users of the built environment and as clients of the architectural process. 
And I asked myself whether or not, if one really took women's roles into consideration, uh, whether or not there might be different designs for good housing, for good neighborhoods, that um, really were aimed at the idea of making women uh, more equal as citizens and giving women more access to public life. It's curious that I had to ask those questions in such a straightforward way in Cambridge, Massachusetts in the late 60s and the early 70s. Betty Friedan had asked those questions in the late 50s and the early 60s when she'd written her book, The Feminine Mystique. And indeed, she concluded that, that the great problem for America was what she called the problems that have no name. Um, the concentration of women in isolated, unpaid housework in single family dream houses that, that um, simply hid a great deal of women's contribution to the necessary work of society. Well, I was pondering the problems that I thought had no name and wondering about these issues. And I discovered, in fact, that in that very same town, Cambridge, Massachusetts, there was a woman in 1868, a full century before, named Melusina Fay Peirce, who had set her mind to providing some very interesting theory and practice having to do with these same questions. In 1868, Melusina Fay Peirce in Cambridge, Massachusetts, organized 40 housewives, uh, first with a meeting down in the post office, and then they rented a building on Bow Street near Harvard Square. And in that building, they mended clothes, they did laundry, they did cooking, and they did grocery shopping and provisioning. And they took the clean laundry and the mended clothes and the cooked meals and delivered them to the husbands in back in those private houses for cash on delivery. <laughs> this was a sensation in 1868, I promise you. <laughs> Melusina Peirce was written about as far away as, you know, the London Times picked up the story of this, and way out on the frontier in Colorado and Wyoming where there were stirrings of the suffrage movement, people picked up this. It was, it was a most a uh, wonderful polemical campaign, and with it actually came some prescriptions for a new domestic architecture. Melusina Peirce believed that perhaps uh, when this organization was thoroughly established and successful, and she called it a cooperative housekeeping society, the housewives who had organized this as a producer's cooperative uh, would then be able to go on to sort of reorganize neighborhoods and workspaces. And her idea was that neighborhoods should have about 36 kitchenless houses in them. The kitchen should be moved out of the home because it was a workplace and a, really no need to make it private. And that there should be a socialized center for domestic labor where all of this efficient work went on, which would use the new technology of the time. Currently, um, things such as uh, special stoves, dishwashers, um, coolers for liquids, sort of early forms of the refrigerator, or, or early washing machines, currently then only available for hotels and restaurants and commercial laundries. So it was a very shrewd proposal technologically about using what you could use at that time. And it was also an interesting proposal in terms of neighborhood design. It was a polemical proposal and, and never fully realized, but Melusina Peirce, whose picture you see here, set off a campaign which lasted 60 years, a feminist campaign to transform the family in the 19th century and early 20th century, to transform housing design and urban design according to some of those ideas about the egalitarian family. And on the other slide, you can see some ways in which I have tried to categorize uh, the causes of that time and the causes of our time in the women's movement and to also talk about what spatial scale they may be occurring at and what social scale they're occurring at. I often find that um, it's very difficult to think about how you break down political campaigns and even how you break down social science literature and make it relevant to architecture and physical planning. But I'm interested in these issues. And so here I've tried to break down the spatial scale into body, dwelling in residential neighborhoods, city, and nation. And if you want to think about what sort of subcategories of our disciplines connect to those, I would say environmental psychology, 
architecture and physical planning, uh, larger scale urban planning, and national economic planning. The social scale of these issues, or the way you might see them discussed in the social science literature, would be biological reproduction, in other words, carrying on the species, reproduction of daily life, reproduction of social relations, and reproduction of the national political economy. And the causes in the 19th century were labeled domestic feminism in terms of women gaining more control within the home, material feminism, that's Melusina Peirce's campaign to transform housing and neighborhoods and socialize domestic work, social feminism, which is what we think of as the feminism of the settlement house reformers, um, the women who were interested in cleaning up the city and ending municipal corruption who were so important to the founding of urban planning as a discipline, people like Jane Addams, Florence Kelly, and at the, at the national level, suffrage, which was the one issue that was supposed to wrap up all the others, spatially and politically, and, and uh, was to be achieved through a national constitutional amendment. I believe in our own times, the patterns have been pretty similar. We're still struggling for reproductive rights, that is abortion, um, freedom from forced sterilization, sexual preference, and so forth. Women are still also struggling for positions around some of these household issues, which may involve male housework, uh, a room of one's own, wages for housework is mentioned also. And at the level of the city, people are arguing for freedom from violence against women in the city, arguing that women should be able to take back the night, walk in the city without fear at night. And at the national level, we've had great disappointments, but also a great deal of energy put into this constitutional amendment, the ERA. Now, I would argue that housing and physical planning connected to this middle level of issues about the dwelling in the residential neighborhood are extremely important for both the women's movement and for our disciplines of architecture and urban planning. And I, and I hope to then be able to really illustrate this well for you. Here is Melusina Peirce's scheme of what she wanted, the kitchenless houses and the cooperative housekeeping center, and the kind of equipment from a commercial laundry she believed her women cooperators should be able to purchase and own. The next person who followed her in the 19th century, uh, Marie Stevens Howland, made a very strong plea for childcare and argued that even if you had a most perfect private family, you should still have adequate publicly supported child care because that was the way that children would really learn about society and this was, this was something which would develop them as individuals. And you see a 19th century child care center of the kind that Howland wanted to build on the right. She worked in a number of different cities and with a number of different groups, ultimately collaborating on the plan for a city with child care and kitchenless houses, which was never built, but was an interesting set of diagrams. This is a third woman who worked on these campaigns. Her name was Mary Livermore. She proposed dining clubs, which should be established in the center of um, neighborhoods or in the center of, in they, they, there were about 20, 23 of these established in Midwestern towns in the 18, between the 1860s and 1890s in a dining club, and you see one in Warren, Ohio on the right, what would usually happen would be that the men and women in a town would decide they would attempt one of these experiments. They would put the dining room table, the dining um, room furniture, chairs, tablecloths, napkins, silver, uh, they'd put, pile all that into a wagon and take it down to the middle of town. and then. 10 or 15 families would arrange their dining room furniture in the central building. They would organize a way of buying groceries and cooking the meals. Either the women would be taking turns, or possibly they would be hiring one of the new graduates from a domestic science school. Those were just starting at that time. Often the men participated, but generally not in the cooking. They would perhaps have a library. They might have um, Christmas and Thanksgiving dinners. They might celebrate people's birthdays. That particular dining club that you see a picture of lasted for 23 years in that town. And what's quite striking is that not only did people find this level of cooperation acceptable and pleasurable, but back home, those empty, emptied out rooms that were kitchens and dining rooms 
Women often used them to establish offices, and in this town in Ohio, women were running the national correspondence for the women's suffrage campaign. So every one of those spaces that was uh, vacated for this purpose you know, became an office where people handled the extensive correspondence and financial affairs that those national political campaigns required. It was not, however, enough for people to talk about cooperation and to make little experiments to change people's minds about how to use housing space or how to get together with other families. This was still the campaign of a minority of women in the 19th century, but here's someone who tried to make it a much larger issue. This is Ellen Richards and a picture of her scientific kitchen. It doesn't look very scientific to us. But she was the first woman graduate of MIT and the first woman to teach at MIT. She was a specialist in pure air, pure water, and pure food. And she tried to make her kitchens look like scientific laboratories. Here is the kitchen that she built at the uh, World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. It's a little suburban house facade wrapped around a scientific kitchen. She wanted there to be one of these in every neighborhood, preparing food at a very low cost, nutritious food, and she um, published this plan for a public kitchen on the other side. Uh, if you look at it carefully, you'll realize that, of course, her dream has come true all over the United States. The waiting hall, the kitchen, and the dining hall. This is McDonald's and Burger King and Chicken Delight, only it's not staffed by well-paid women scientists. <laughs> and the food is perhaps uh, not as interesting as we or she would have liked it to be. This is another woman in this series of uh, reformers named Charlotte Perkins Gilman, who um, was the most famous feminist economist at the turn of the century. She wrote a book called Women in Economics in 1898. And on the other screen is one of her followers, Alice Constance Austin, who was a self-trained architect, a follower of Ebenezer Howard in the Garden Cities movement, and a follower of Gilman, who tried to produce a design for a city of kitchenless houses to be built out in the Mojave Desert near Palmdale in 1914. It was a most intriguing plan because it showed that if you really took these ideas logically, you'd have to think about new conceptions of infrastructure as well as new conceptions of housing. What she proposed was that there should be an underground little system of trams on railroad lines and that women would put their dirty dishes and their dirty laundry in the trams, shoot them into the city center, the cooperative housekeeping center would produce the clean food and the clean laundry, and they'd shoot them back on the railroad again. It was never constructed, uh, but I think as a polemic, it was, it was quite an intriguing one. Charlotte Perkins Gilman was herself a great polemicist. She ran around the country giving lectures with famous lines in them like, home sweet home has never meant housework sweet housework. And she could always um, tell people that, in fact, human evolution which was what most uh, liberals and radicals believed in at that time as a great saving force. They were social Darwinists in the cooperative mode. She would say human evolution of a cooperative and positive kind was being slowed down by the way that women were oppressed in society and that until you really supported women as economically self-sufficient and um, socially self-sufficient characters, whether they had children or not, you would always, you would always have hobbled society. So Gilman had proposals for apartment hotels with childcare facilities and kitchens to serve uh, working women and mothers. Um, she really proposed that single parenthood should become accepted as a normal and appropriate thing in American society, which of course today we, we will accept. But she was a very early pioneer trying to take the stigma off single parenthood and say it should be possible for a woman to earn her own living and take care of her children and that those two things should not be incompatible. She should have housing and social services to make that acceptable. Gilman influenced Ebenezer Howard in the Garden Cities movement in England, probably the most famous town planner of the early 20th century. Ebenezer Howard read Gilman's books, talked to Gilman, and came up with what he called a cooperative quadrangle, which was an apartment grouping of about 30 units around a courtyard with a common dining room. Ebenezer Howard thought that his invention, because it became architectural after he worked with Raymond Unwin and some other well-known architects on these schemes, was such an invention that he was the equal of James Watt, who'd, who'd invented the steam engine, 
um, Watt had invented the steam engine, but Howard gave himself credit for figuring out how to really utilize half the labor of society more effectively, the women's half. Unfortunately, he never became known for that. He built about six of these projects, but the garden cities had financiers who really moved things in another direction. And that went on from about the 1890s to the 1920s. Finally, in the 20s, right here in Los Angeles, in Hollywood, we had another experiment along the lines of cooperative living. This is a plan I'm sure you all have memorized, the Schindler House on the King's Road in Hollywood, with the spaces, private spaces for the four adults, where they were going to carry on their life's work, and the one kitchen, which was to be shared. Now, there are little uh, sleeping porches above the bedrooms where the sleeping um, activities were given some private area. But that one kitchen, if you look at it carefully, you'll see that the two women's private workspaces include the only circulation into the common kitchen. And it was not exactly a fully cooperative arrangement. There was still a fair amount of gender role playing to be worked out around this. And it, it didn't last as, a, uh, as an housing experiment, although Schindler thought that it would and thought that he had perhaps created a house design that would influence the 20th century in a much more substantial way than it has. In the 20s also, we saw the experiments of the Soviet Union to develop collective houses, communal houses, and here we see one built in Moscow in 1929. The idea was that there should be substantial uh, kitchen facilities and childcare, that women as well as men would be drawn into the industrial labor force. Of course, many of those Russian projects were really fairly uh, terrifying in terms of their detailing and construction. They were bleak, and it was a country that really was not equipped uh, in terms of its economic resources or its technology to carry through on its housing goals of the 20s. So there was talk about shared facilities, but indeed, there were two and three families sometimes sharing what was supposed to be an individual person's private apartment. And under those circumstances, nobody wants to talk about a future of larger sharing. In the early 30s, the experiments in Russia were ended. Stalin was in power. And not only were those housing experiments ended, but also it became more difficult to get an abortion or get a divorce or to feel like uh, the Soviet Union had in any substantial way carried through on its promises to women workers. There were, however, in the 30s, some very interesting experiments in Sweden. These, here you see the plans of an apartment uh, hotel built in Stockholm by um, the architect Markelius, and Alva Myrdal was his collaborator. Some of you may know that name because she's just recently won the Nobel Prize for her work on world peace. And after an early career as a sociologist and a feminist, she went into the diplomatic corps but when she was working with Marcalius, they devised this program on the ground floor, which is on the right. The building included uh, complete restaurant facilities and childcare facilities and some offices. And then upstairs, the units could either be seen as private living units for, for one or two people or as workplaces. And some people actually used them as small offices or studios. There were artists and architects in the building. And it seems to have functioned extremely well. There was always a long waiting list to get into it. And it was still functioning in the 1940s and 50s when Life magazine even sent a reporter over to Stockholm to interview the residents and claimed that this was a very desirable thing we should import to the United States for those um, women who had worked in World War II who'd want to continue working. Of course, that was still quite a minority voice. Mostly what was going on in this country in the 20s and the 30s was the beginning of an amnesia about all these earlier projects and proposals and all of this earlier flexibility in terms of what housing might or might not include in the way of social services and collective facilities. This woman is Ethel Puffer Howes, who worked in the 20s and the 30s to establish a research institute for what she called the coordination of women's interests. This was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation and established at Smith College. They had plans for model community kitchens, plans for model child care services. They had placement services for women. And they taught courses for college women to acquaint them with their responsibilities to continue both paid work and motherhood and to tell them about the strains this might cause in their lives as they attempted to pursue this. But the context of all of this earnest work by Ethel Puffer House, which I think was, was uh, 
very well put together and still makes very interesting uh, reading, was that there was a national campaign. The beginnings of the large American policy of home ownership could be seen in the 20s, not only in pamphlets like this one with the title, Good Homes Make Contented Workers. That's a 1919 pamphlet um, promoting home ownership with phrases in it such as, um, if you want a worker to be a good, stable worker, you should, you should uh, get him tied down to a long mortgage. Um, that that's, that's really the appropriate way to deal with strikes and labor disputes. There were, it's quite common from that period of the 20s to read about um, the desire to inculcate conservative, stable values in working men. One of the reasons for this is that the year that pamphlet came out, there were four million American workers on strike, and uh, it was the end of World War I and a turbulent time. But the, but the proposals of the 20s included substantial um, backlash against women who'd finally won suffrage in 1920, Republican and Democratic women, led by people like Ethel Puffer Howes in those years, formed a Women's Joint Coordinating Committee to influence legislation concerning women and children in Congress. They were Republican women and Democratic women joining together, and they were roundly denounced as un-American and socialistic for trying to work across party lines. The president of the National Association of Manufacturers uh, was particularly upset about some of these uh, women who were agitating for housing reform. He stood up at one point in the early 20s and said that all American women were taking their orders from Madame Kolontai in the Soviet Union. She was uh, Lenin's minister of family and uh, social services. But in fact, of course, they were just carrying on the tradition that uh, some of those spunky American housewives like Melusina Peirce had started some 40, 50, 60 years earlier. The campaign, however, for housing as a stabilizing factor in the economy and the um, and in labor issues was continuing through the 20s and the 30s. Probably some of you have read about Herbert Hoover and his successes along these lines. Hoover was Secretary of Commerce in the 1920s, and as Secretary of Commerce, he started founding um, clubs that would promote home ownership and home building around the country, uh, Better Homes in America clubs. They had um, small businessmen, real estate agents, uh, people in construction, people in banking. Through the mid-20s, there were three or 4,000 of these clubs around the United States. And they saw home ownership and home construction as a crucial area of the economy. If one had a single family home ownership policy, they believed, supported by the government, it would not only be a policy that would support long-term economic growth, but it would support the consumption of a lot of commodities that would go inside those single family homes. Well, it's a very interesting and complicated period in the 20s and the 30s because the depression arrives and one, sh one would think would sink many of, pe many of these people's hopes for home ownership as a, an American political policy. But what happens is that ultimately Hoover emerges as president and he tries to think of something positive to do in the depression and in 1931 he holds a national conference on home building and home ownership, brings back all his friends from these clubs and they really reassert the importance of home ownership as a long-term economic recovery strategy from the depression. We see then the revival of images like this, the one on the right coming from the 1890s and being reasserted. The angel with the sword of justice is offering the worker the home at $10 a month. And on the other screen, a sampler from 1935, really contemporary with some of Hoover's efforts. It could really be from the Victorian era though. Home fires are brightest, home ties are strongest, home loves are happiest, home lives are happiest, home loves are dearest. And people would sort of forget that women had really been in the paid labor force in large numbers, especially in tough jobs in World War I, that women had won suffrage. Women were demanding a large role in public life. The images begin to take that away. And finally comes the architectural design competition, which I think epitomizes the spirit of the 30s. Architectural Forum and General Electric, in the middle of the Depression, ran a competition for the um, House for Modern Living. And many architects entered from all over the country. The program went something like this. 
The house is to be for Mr. and Mrs. Bliss. Mr. Bliss is an engineer who loves his work, and Mrs. Bliss is a college graduate. She has a degree, I think it's in home economics, but she prefers not to work in the paid labor force. She enjoys being at home. They have a couple of kids, and uh, he has a basement workshop where he likes to tinker and make things, and she loves to bake. And you're to design the ideal home for them, which will be a model for American living in the future. Future is the word here. And would it surprise you to know that the first prize winner put some 27 electric appliances in this house. That is, every appliance that General Electric made. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there is then this strange period of World War II, which suddenly intervenes. Women, we get in World War II the immediate return to the claims of the material feminists the immediate arrival of daycare, housing related to daycare, housing with social services, and housing located near women's jobs. And in the post-World War II era, there's then some confusion. We have seen that it's not utopia. In 10 months, with the pressure of the Kaiser shipyards and the Federal Public Housing Authority, the United States was able to deliver on these most ambitious programs for the egalitarian home environment. And then it's rolled back again. In the late 40s and early 50s, there's a period of uncertainty. One finds this article, for example, Should Housewives Be Paid a Salary? It appears in 1947 in um, American Home Magazine. The woman is complaining all this, and Glamour Girl too. And yet, we find the inevitable production of the little boxes. These are some of William Garnett's aerial photographs of a tract in California. The land is cleared, the foundations are poured, the framing is done, and the space is enclosed. And this is what the United States dedicates its overwhelming riches and resources to for the next 20 or 30 years. I think you probably all know how it comes about. There are va vast tax deductions for home mortgage interest, which are established in 1939. There are highway building programs that uh, make it easier to get out to land, which is, is being developed as suburbs through the um, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And there are home um, FHA and VA mortgage insurance programs to make the financing easier for the developers. And at the same time, uh, that you see people lining up in front of model houses in the 50s with signs like Vets No Down and American Flags out in front. Um, it's interesting to know that the FHA was so conservative that they penalized any designer who wanted to, say, have housing with flat roofs. You'd get points off for that. It was thought to be somehow not quite as American and not quite as uh, saleable. And you would simply not get FHA financing if you plan to have an integrated development. Whether you wanted to integrate Hispanic families or black families, uh, that was enough to finish your FHA financing. And so these were to be segregated tracts, and it was justified on the basis of uh, saleability, resaleability of the homes. It was a profoundly racist program, and one would then find uh, major developers echoing some pretty um, unpleasant sentiments. For example, uh, with someone like um, Levitt, uh, he said that as a Jew, there was no room in his life for racial prejudice, but nevertheless, he knew that if he sold to a black family, his entire development would be finished, and so he wouldn't. And Levitt also said in 1948 that he, he uh, he said, quote, no man who owns his house and lot can be a communist. He has too much to do. He's got to be finishing the attic and fixing the garden. <laughs> and I expect he would have said if he thought of it, no woman who has her Levitt house can be a women's liberationist. She has too much to do. Um, at any rate, these houses did not come in a, in a sort of neutral way, free of ideological preconceptions. They were, they were very firmly laden with ideas about gender roles and about race about class, and about the stability of American society. There were certainly some good things about these houses. 
uh, there was such an enormous housing crisis after World War II, such a shortage since there hadn't been any construction during World War II and very slow construction in the Depression, that in fact you had be-ribboned war heroes with medals all over their uniforms sleeping in their cars and sleeping on the sofa in their um, parents-in-law's home. And anybody like Levitt or Kaiser, uh, people who believed they could build these tracks, was thought to be a national hero for simply getting those war heroes uh, a roof over their heads. But it was, not, it was not a national policy solution which was successful in every way. First of all, you began to see things like this. This is uh, Levittown in 1948, before the landscaping has matured. And you began to see the kind of shopping center development which goes with that sort of suburban track development. That's uh, New Jersey or Long Island shopping center on the right of the 50s. This began to cover the landscape. It began to take over the primary uh, predominant part of the American built environment. And with every year, there were more and more Americans who were buying their homes on long mortgages until it got up to a national average of about 60%. Um, Some of the uh, subtle selling uh, pitches which came with them uh, from the 50s, the woman. Th these are advertisements from builders' journals, uh, appliance manufacturers selling things to builders. She sees the American kitchen, so they buy the house. You better put it in. Or on the other side, uh, what every woman really wants is a home management center. And uh, it's, it's, it's tremendously ironic to see that when you know what women had earlier suggested might be appropriate. And here are a couple of my favorite images, too. On one screen, you see an advertisement for tap and ranges from the 60s. The kitchen has almost everything, the range, the oven, the dishwasher, the disposer, the freezer. Only one thing is missing, you. <laughs> in other words, no matter how many machines you put in there, you may not really be lessening the number of hours that you'll spend there yourself. In a recent book, historian Ruth Cohen has actually argued uh, that there's more work for mother, that the number of hours has constantly been going up despite the arrival of the so-called labor-saving machines. And I think the historian Susan Strasser, who wrote a book called Never Done, would, conf would, would agree with that also. On the other screen, you see a posed photograph from Life by their photographer Nina Lean in the 1950s. It's the housewife with seven days' worth of work. <laughs> That's the 1950s. <laughs> but it's still with us. It's still with us. And one then sees somewhat more surreal imagery. <laughs> this is the 1960s. <laughs> Housework is really just playing in the garden. And then we get uh, the arrival of fast food with slogans like Colonel Sanders' famous slogan, showing the happy family together with a bucket of chicken. It's nice to feel so good about a meal. There is this pressure for consumption which uh, I think this little ad for the Pledge Furniture Sweepstakes suggests. You don't just need the house, you have to have a whole world of stuff inside it. And that consumption can include things like, there's supposed to be labor saving devices like frozen foods, but watch what happens when things like frozen foods or fast food, Colonel Sanders arrive. There are women on that assembly line, low paid non-union women making those frozen dinners, and there are low paid non-union adolescents and women making the Colonel Sanders food. And it is not, it's a growing sector of the economy because more and more women move into the paid labor force, but it's not a particularly um, satisfactory industry to be in if you're a worker. Still, there is sometimes this notion that women don't work in the 50s and 60s and 70s. And here's a little cartoon. You see the woman getting her child out of the crib in the morning and serving the breakfast. And then that little red balloon says, my wife doesn't work. That's the guy having lunch in the pub telling his, telling his buddy that he can support his wife and she doesn't need to work. There's a way in which both men and women begin to forget that child rearing and housework is work, that people measure it as taking 50 or 60 hours a week, uh, probably longer than the number of uh, hours worked by people in wage labor. And on the other screen, you see Woman House, done here in Los Angeles in the early 70s. 
The kitchen was made entirely pink because it was supposed to be a feminine color. The appliances were painted pink. The tools were painted pink. There are fried eggs turning into nurturing breasts coming down the walls. And inside the kitchen drawers, you see newspaper lining those kitchen drawers with stories about women in public life. But what that surreal environment is really saying is something very, very frightening about the enclosing of women in the private sphere. Well, that's the feminist critique of suburbia, and it's familiar to us. There is also a tremendous critique of the American dream house pattern, which comes with the environmental movement of the 60s. The environmental movement criticizes the waste uh, in terms of land use, the traffic patterns that come with suburban sprawl. And finally, we begin to see alternative designs for what are said to be more ecologically sound houses. We see the one on the right from uh, Berkeley, the integral urban house with a pond for raising fish in the basement and the solar heating on the roof and the composting toilet. And uh, yet, in some ways, uh, what's disappointing about both the feminist protests against the suburban dream house and the environmentalist protest is that there are no very powerful alternatives that come out. When the feminist movement finally had a strong representative, uh, Donna Shalala, as undersecretary of HUD, the first thing she did was to try to change mortgage requirements so that women would be permitted um, access to mortgages. And this slogan that they used was, in the Carter administration, if a woman's place is in the home, it might as well be her own. Well, that's correcting a long-standing difficulty, but it isn't a feminist alternative to the suburban dream house. Similarly, in many ways, I think the environmentalist project of the 60s were the suburban dream house with some new technology and some new trappings. They were not always proposals for larger uh, replanning of neighborhoods and larger replanning of social services and relationships. It's not that they weren't very pointed models of what was wrong. Thousands of people went through the integral urban house, just as thousands of people went through woman house. But I don't know that they came away feeling as though they really knew what to do about these problems. However, there's no shortage of people who claim they do have solutions. If any of you read the Journal of the American Planning uh, Association, you'll find in the last year, Advertisements call Let's Save the American Dream from the Manufactured Housing Institute. This is a lobbying, lobbying group for the makers of mobile homes. They claim that they can save the American dream, uh, that in years when the price of a single family house is up in the $80,000, $90,000 range, they can still give you a three bedroom house on a, on a private lot for $43,475. And then furthermore, they can save the family because it'll be possible for children to live in the same neighborhood as their parents, for elderly people to live in the same neighborhood as their children. They really think that they claim America has a housing crisis and we have the solution and everyone will benefit. Well, it's altogether um, too speedy and too simple a solution, although when you read about the way that New York City has placed 10 manufactured suburban dream houses on Charlotte Street in the South Bronx, and how much publicity they've gained out of that as a sort of urban band-aid. Uh, it, se it seems to me these people have been quite effective in getting their message across without people reminding them of the disadvantages of this whole detached house on the lot problem in the first place. Here we see those um, little detached um, manufactured houses on a lot ready to be moved off to solve the housing crisis in your community at the same time that the New York Times is publishing the cartoon showing the dream house devouring the family uh, because of the current prices of single family houses. And that was 1977. It hasn't stopped going up. We find, too, that the problems of housing are not strictly confined to the aging tracts of single family homes, which are getting too expensive for the World War II families uh, who are now the elderly and retired to stay in. They're too expensive for their children to buy into. Uh, the problems are not confined to those tracks. There's still an enormous problem of what's happened in the limited amount of public housing we've built in the United States. 
Overall, it's a very tiny percentage of the national housing stock, but in most of that public housing, the unit plans were really simulating the notion of an intact family with breadwinner and housewife and children. The um, project plans supported that too. There were generally no paid jobs within those projects. There were no daycare centers within those projects. And when those projects turned out to contain minority families and single parent families and the elderly overwhelmingly, it was a crisis that um, affected those unfortunate residents very severely. And the United States needs to think about what to do with those aging public housing projects of the 40s and 50s, as well as with those tracts. Now, in the course of looking for some solutions, questions, uh, have come to me about what the United States could do in terms of new construction and what it might do in terms of remodeling of our existing housing stock. And in the course of, of looking at housing in 10 or 12 foreign countries, I came across a good um, five or six projects that I thought were particularly provocative in terms of the way they approach solutions. And I'd, I'd like to just say a few words about them. On the uh, right-hand screen is a project in Denmark uh, called Tingern, which is um, a project where it's uh, government-subsidized housing. In the first phase, which you see the site plan of here, there were about 75 units. It was broken down into courtyards of about uh, 14 or 15 families per courtyard. Uh, the site plan permitted people to have both private um, space looking out into quiet, grassy areas and busy internal courtyards. And every family gave up 10% of their internal space in this project in order that a, a, a central space could be built for the 14 or 15 families who shared a courtyard. And here you can see some of these plans. On the right is a plan of the community building built for every 14 or 15 families. It's a very multi-purpose space, two-level space. It had a with uh, the mailboxes lined up on it so that everyone could come and get their mail and sit around and chat. Then it had um, it, a very um, open space that could be used for meetings, classes, daycare center. And then two or three steps below it, another space that could be used as a kitchen and a common laundry room. And as I saw these buildings, I thought they worked quite well and in many flexible and different ways for different groups of families. The unit plans are on the other side. And what was intriguing about the scheme of giving away people's square footage in order to build a community space was that they also had a plan for eventually getting it back and adding on to their private units in time if they could afford to and wanted the extra space for a roomer or a boarder or a relative. Another project from Holland, which I found very intriguing, was Aldo van Eyck's project, The Mother's House, built in Amsterdam. It's housing for single-parent families and includes very special spaces for child care and child raising, as well as uh, living space, so, so that those families can really find the support they need to reconstruct their lives. No, I'm sorry, this uh, set of plans is tipped around. Then on the other screen is a project uh, from Cambridge, Massachusetts in our own culture. It's by Gwen Rono. It's the conversion of an existing building, which is a Victorian parsonage. And I'm sorry I don't have slides of the plans. Um, I had just um, missed getting them into the carousel tonight. But there are in that building now six private condominiums plus a space which is a living room and dining room for the six elderly people to share, and a guest room which is shared by all six. And the balance between privacy and community achieved there, I think, is, is something that's really very uh, intriguing. It suggests that people need support for their lives, but, uh, but not in any sense communal living or an extremely collective situation. And this is another project for Massachusetts that I like a lot. These are the plans of the Captain Clarence Eldridge House, which is built for the elderly. It's congregate housing for the elderly out on Cape Cod. And the designers um, started with a, um, an old sea captain's house. And that sea captain's house provided some of the social spaces uh, and a very, very broad front, front porch, which you can see in the, in the plan on the left. And then around that were built private units with a bedroom and bath and little uh, extra uh, kind of kitchenette areas for each elderly resident. 
There was a good deal of attention given to the programming here and the social planning. John Zeisel worked as a consultant on the uh, living needs of the elderly. And you can see with all the annotation of these plans, a good deal of, of care was, was uh, expended on truly making people feel that they had a private basis for their adult lives as well as a way of coming together. Now, those are suggestions about what, might, what one might do in terms of either new construction or um, a combination of preservation and new construction. I'd also like to produce some suggestions of my own about what could happen in single family R1 tracts. We see on the left-hand screen a slide from the 1940s uh, in that funny period when people didn't know quite what was going to happen. Uh, this is from Architectural Forum in the 1940s, a proposal that perhaps five single-family houses might share childcare facilities, sports facilities, and uh, a swimming pool. Well, you can see that the image of the male homeowner paying for it all is dominating the diagram while the woman's pushing the baby carriage. But assuming that we were to take diagrams like that and then ask if they could apply in any way to the 1980s, I have sketched on the other screen what you might see in a tract of 10 houses, what you might see if you began to introduce a program for people to um, put some common open space into that block. In terms of making common open space, I've been very intrigued by the city agency that operates in Zurich in Switzerland, where they put together architects, landscape architects, lawyers, and physical planning consultants to help any group of neighbors who wanted to change the configuration of land on their block, uh, negotiate the necessary easements and donations and so forth to create little parks in the centers of blocks. They found that was a very successful program there, and I think it's something that could be done here, assuming that neighbors did wish to connect a little bit more to each other, think about establishing facilities like childcare centers um, together. Um, that could be a way to begin. What I see going on in R1 neighborhoods is instead this illegal process of putting units in the attic and units in the basement, units in the garage, suddenly producing three and four households living in what once was a single family house without any appropriate planning or concern for open space or social services going on contemporaneously. Many physical planners are not sure what to do about this. Should they look the other way and consider this a new arrival of cheap housing? Or, sh or should they um, change the zoning laws and, and make every R1 neighborhood into a two-family neighborhood? Um, there's been a lot of debate. No one's come up with uh, a full program. But I would say, in that case, planners should really attempt to replan, should find ways of making uh, tax-deferred, should find, should find ways of reorganizing property taxes, reorganizing community assessments, um, manipulating the, the various financial possibilities uh, to, begin, to begin to think about recapturing common space in neighborhoods that are becoming denser in the number of units, and should maybe even think about the kinds of things that are happening in diagram C there, where I'm not only showing some common land in the center of that block, but suggesting that the whole block can really begin to turn inside and that what's labeled as number four could be a zone for new collective facilities such as daycare centers um, reaching out of the back of some of those buildings. And that indeed if you think about traditions such as the Village Green uh, or the Radburn Plan in the United States, we have a long tradition of talking about whether or not the suburban block can be turned inside out. And it, it may be that with this new process of making every single family house a two and three family house, those opportunities might come back to us again that were once lost in the 30s and the 40s. In my book, Redesigning the American Dream, I also make a brief argument about going beyond new construction and the renovation of R1 districts to look again at the question of public space uh, from the point of view of these old stereotypes about gender roles. If in suburbia, what we did was to recreate the Victorian family, the gender roles of the 1840s in the 1940s, the father as the breadwinner and the patriarch and the mother as the self-sacrificing uh, person who stayed home all day, we got really this phrase, a woman's place is in the home, uh, heavily, uh, heavily pounded in the culture again. 
And at the same time, we, we also really began to reinforce the Victorian stereotypes about women staying out of public places. And if the first phrase was, you know, a woman's place is in the home, the second phrase about public space was, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? I can't go into all the details about the public-private interplay. Uh, I hope some of you might be interested in the details, and, and uh, the book will give you those. But I would just like to say that women not only have campaigned to get out of the home and out of housework and into public life, they've also campaigned to be free from harassment on the streets. And here you see 19th century woman and this cartoon of harassment on the street. And you see 19, in the 1920s, a group of women office workers who'd formed the anti-flirt club to avoid being harassed on the streets. And here are some contemporary views from Los Angeles, photographs of women who are on the streets. This woman sitting here near a, a billboard with uh, Kim offering her charms in Las Vegas. And on the other screen, a picture uh, in Hollywood for advertising the film, The Bitch. When women have to negotiate their way between the private suburban world uh, with its set of stereotypes and the public world, uh, where we see another set of gender stereotypes. And when men and children have to negotiate these two, we are all in our daily lives having some very uncomfortable and difficult experiences. So I would like to conclude uh, just by, to sum up, to say that I think that men and women and children might begin to imagine new forms of housing, new forms of neighborhoods, and new patterns in urban design, which can lift us beyond the old uh, American suburban dream into something which would better suit our lives as equal citizens and as equal workers in the 1880s and the 1890s. Uh, we got the stereotypes which uh, really provided the essence of the Victorian era, the stereotypes that uh, were then for the middle class and were in the early 20th century emulated uh, for the working class. And in the 1980s and the 1990s, I hope that we may finally be able to step beyond those and into some other patterns of living. Thank you very much. questions, if anybody has questions. I can't see. <laughs> so, much, so much of suburbia has been on the automobile, um, <laughs> and the automobile has always been this one. I mean, you see the uh, automobile fitting in, maybe the majority of the blocks inside the house. That's a good question. I think that of course, in the Radburn plan and in Baldwin Hills and the Village Green and so forth, you saw these, these courts that were carefully designed to hold the automobiles that were alternating with the courts that were going to hold the people. And um, in the um, current R1 tracks, if you convert your two-car garage into a one-bedroom or two-bedroom, or say you convert it into a one-bedroom unit or a studio, what happens is that two more cars get dumped out on the street. And this is one reason why you need very careful planning as those conversions occur. I think part of the answer would be in public transportation. Part of the answer could also be in extending existing networks for carpooling and for um, pr probably shopping trips, the kind of things that neighbors often do informally right now could perhaps be done more, more um, systematically. Yeah?
I think that I didn't get into the topic of childcare in any in any detail, and it's a fascinating one. And the United States is the only, is is really about the only advanced industrial society in the world that doesn't have a national childcare policy. So Nixon vetoed a national childcare bill in this country in the 70s, and we've really we've really been lagging very far behind in terms of having adequate care for the children of working parents. I'm all in favor of getting the elderly involved and in favor of trying to find ways that you can put um, needed social services together to, to uh, help make a community feel more coherent. I, cer I certainly wouldn't um, advocate you know, shipping children off to bureaucratic child care centers in distant spots, but th that's sort of the topic you know, for a whole for a whole hour in itself. And it's a really rich and complicated and interesting one. I guess what I would just say to everyone here is as soon as you're designing housing, it would be very important to think about how the child care connects into that housing design and to have some position on that. Because I'm often distressed when people are, people are constantly given large and complicated design problems involving housing and daycare just doesn't seem to come into the program. Well, I think that we're at the stage in the United States where the crucial problems involve programming and the uh, acquisition of adequate resources, and that we've been operating with really inadequate programs for housing, and that developers are constantly offering up those inadequate programs, and so are um, some agencies that are involved with subsidized housing, and that it's very difficult to talk about innovation in terms of style if you're still at the level of having a totally inadequate program. And I'm interested in the stylistic issues too, but I don't think that, that stylistic issues can give you, the, give you the solution in terms of what's happening with households and what's happening with neighborhoods and what's happening with the integration of jobs and social services with, with residents. I, I should maybe also say, I mean, if, if, uh, if you have, if you have, you know, if, if you have an idea about the way in which you would want to integrate stylistic issues with those programming issues, I'd be interested in knowing what it is. Okay. to be a society of uh, lots of single men and lots of single women, and the single men have washers and dryers and dishwashers and quiz in arts, and the women have the same? Is that equality? No, exactly, exactly. <laughs> oh, I think it's here. It's true. I mean, and you can also say that men and women will each have word processors and computers at home, and we are, we're certainly... We're certainly in a society that values technology in the home. Constantly we're finding, I would say that big te technological developments of the 20th century have, invi have involved miniaturizing technologies which have first started out for socialized production, whether it's lawn commercial laundries or commercial computer centers, and miniaturizing those technologies and sending them into the home. So it may well be that to understand what happened to the housewife, in the past is to understand what might happen to the computer worker in the future. 
there, there are a lot of lessons to be learned. And if you, if you wonder whether it's a good thing for young men to have six major appliances all to themselves, that's a, that's a reasonable thing to be wondering about, you know. <laughs> it's a lot of time and money. It's um, a fascinating thing to think about how trailer courts and also uh, parks for recreational vehicles, like the ones that house elderly people in snow, called snowbirds or whatever, how they insert collective facilities into their plans, um, partly for need, par partly because these are unusual communities. I personally um, don't feel terribly drawn to solutions that involve manufactured housing units of any kind. Uh, I'm intrigued at the ways that sometimes those places do establish a sort of instant community, both physical and social, and I'd, I'd love to know more about it. But when I think about whether or not those solutions are ones that you want to apply to the whole society, uh, I don't know. And I, I find that when I look at those manufactured housing units, they um, seem to me to be miniaturized versions of the Levitt House in one form or another, containing most of the most of the disadvantages of the Levitt House and only the advantages of cheaper production and, and sometimes um, avoiding traditional building codes. And maybe um, there are some labor issues involved there too. But uh, I don't feel very optimistic about finding solutions in that kind of production. I'm mm -hmm. Well, what do you think? Are there some are there some well, things you can find as solutions there? Yeah, I think that's a very interesting solution, but it's, it seems to me it's very untypical of what a lot of those um, places are like. You know, that's special because it's been done by somebody special who's thought about it a lot. Yeah? I think that there are opportunities to get involved with community groups around the um, development of new construction, subsidized housing with um, the integration of, of uh, certain programs for, for uh, jobs and daycare. I think there's a possibility that architects who understand these design implications can work with community organizers, uh, can work with constituencies of single parents, um, tenants, to, to begin to show what the spatial realization of their needs might be like. And there are groups doing that all over the country. Uh, there's the Women's Development Corporation in Providence, Rhode Island. There's the National Congress of Neighborhood Women in uh, Brooklyn, New York. and. Um, there are a couple of groups up in the Bay Area. I think there could be, there could be an art, more of an articulation of those kinds of programs here. I should maybe say that UCLA is having a conference on April 28th. We've had now, um, it will be our fifth annual conference on, on planning and women's needs. This year the topic is the feminization of poverty. It's being co-sponsored by our minority students group, MAPA. And we are going to have at least one panel on 
housing issues, and we have two very well-known activists coming. Um, Alma Felix Green, who's the head of the Women's Development Corporation in Providence, Rhode Island, is going to speak. And Bertha Gilkey, who's the head of the tenants organization in the St. Louis Public Housing Projects that is now beginning to undertake management and construction of those projects is going to speak. So if you're, if you're interested in seeing what's going on on the national scene, you know, come on April 28th. I think it was probably about 1916 that people thought zoning was a marvelous scientific tool and was the answer to all the previous problems that uh, city planners hadn't been able to solve. I wouldn't begin to argue that zoning is the answer to things. I do think, however, that in the United States, uh, zoning disputes are where people talk about the quality of life, the quality of housing, the quality of good neighborhoods, and where people wind up coming together to argue out their prejudices about these things. And um, that currently the, remod the illegal remodeling of those one-family houses uh, is the response to this inadequate housing stock, which is in the configuration of the 1940s and 50s and trying to be used by people in the 1980s. So I think those zoning battles will go on, and I've followed them in newspapers all around this country. And because those battles are going on, I think there has to be a response from the planning profession, uh, which is, and from architects, which is a fairly serious response, as opposed to say, well, okay, let them fight it out, and maybe in some places they will put a second unit in the garage, in other places they won't. It's, it's, a, it's not a complete solution, but I, I think um, this is a time when it's, it's essential to have some response to that. agree, and in my book I tried to find examples, real life examples of people who had done some of these other things. Uh, for example, people who had taken hold of the solar issues in their community and really tried to respond as a town to that, and, I, and uh, people who had taken account of uh, issues about growing food or dealing with transportation problems. And so I have, I have a lot of examples of citizens groups coming to terms with those issues. I was unable to find convincing examples of citizens groups coming to terms with all 10 issues at once. You know, the people who got their pub, who, the people who made the citizens public transportation work weren't interested in solar energy, and the people who made the solar energy work weren't interested in childcare, and the people who made the childcare work, 
you know, I couldn't get something else going. So what I think, ultimately, I've come to believe is that if you can get citizens groups interested in any of these projects and give them the confidence that they can identify a major problem and solve it, then that group is perhaps in a position to move on to issue number two and issue number three. But I think it's, it's possible that certain, in certain ways it can be more, it can be more frustrating to know, indeed, that the, the um, you know, the, the agenda is, is such a terribly long one. And yet, of course, professionals in design and planning and professionals who've thought about large environmental issues, large economic issues, uh, will find, you know, each one of these little efforts very piecemeal, very incremental. But that's the way, you know, that, that the grassroots things usually progress. At the same time, there are these other larger theoretical movements feeding in issues. Well, we're all waiting for that developer to knock on the door every day, right? <laughs> At least once a week, I hope I'm going out to lunch with that person. And <laughs> if I should find that person, I'll give you a call and let you know. So far, not yet. Well, I, I think that, that everybody who is involved with housing and physical planning uh, and urban design issues in this city, whatever agency they're working for, uh, should be thinking very carefully about men, women, and children, and thinking very carefully about making solutions that are accountable to the whole population. And um, that, would be a, that would be a good start. Well, maybe I'll stop here. <laughs> I sh perhaps I should just say one more thing, which is that if some of you are interested, the book is coming out March 12th. <laughs> it has a green cover with an American flag, white houses, and a picket fence. 